Hey, Christy, as ever, that's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And good evening to those there in the room at the campus of Kaplan in Causeway Bay and to all of you on the phone as well. So happy Halloween. I'm impressed the actual session's going on and no one's actually <laughs> out for their fancy dress party, but it's great to be here this evening. Um, I'll probably spend maybe 15 or so minutes going through some statistics and some data that we hope you'll find helpful um, alongside uh, an introduction to the Kaya Association and our qualification as well. Now, I think we have all seen globally that the assets under management in all asset classes, both traditional and alternative, has swollen and grown exponentially the last few years. And some great stats from PwC that came out a, a month or so ago now, of forecasting a growth of a further 5.5% to $145 trillion by 2025, which is a massive number when you think the industry was just a fraction of that back in 2012. So asset growth is continuing. And if you look at what that means for the Asia Pacific, we're going to go from um, around 16 or 17 trillion as of the end of 2020, and that'll swell to almost 30 trillion, so an almost two times growth in what we're going to see for the assets and the management within the Asia Pacific. That's really being triggered by the significant demand that we're seeing from wealth management groups around the world. And with that will come for the businesses that provide products and services, they're going to see a massive spur, um, um, kind of surge in the revenues they're actually going to enjoy as well. And again, here we see that liquid asset growth by 2030 for the Asia Pacific and indeed that wealth management revenue that we're going to enjoy over the coming few years in front of us. Now, public markets have been phenomenally favourable for the last decade and almost so post the global financial crisis. And we've seen a lot more appetite and interest around private markets in the last few years. And that's really been stimulated by how the economy is changing. Now, three groups here that I'm sure we're all familiar with, Uber, Facebook, and Google. You can see for those guys, most of the value, most of the upside for the investors was enjoyed in the pre-IPO of those particular securities. So if you look at what happened for Google, um, they raised $25 million in the private space before they went to IPO and raised a further $1.9 billion when they went public. But look at Facebook, they actually raised $2.4 billion of private capital before they took on a further $16 billion when they went public. And by the time you hit Uber, they actually received almost three times as much funding uh, privately before they went publicly. If you look at that great graph on the left-hand side, all of that value, all of that upside, all of that money is being enjoyed in that private space. So we're really seeing a lot of companies deciding to stay private for longer. Um, versus going out in the IPO world and becoming a public company. Side by side to this is investors are, are finally recognizing that diversification is a great thing. We've had a bull market run of beta for well over a decade. You could have bought a Standard & Poor's or a, um, a Hang Seng Index on, on an ETF and gone home and made an awful lot of money up until most recently. But investors are really thinking much more strongly and much more heavily about diversification. They're looking for enhanced performance. They're looking for inflation hedges. And indeed, they're looking for yield enhancements as well. And that's exactly what's provided with investments into the private markets or into alternative investments. And that's why these numbers are growing for the alternative investments growth over the last 10 or 15 years. And that's set to grow to over 21, if not $22 trillion dollars as we actually enter 2025. And if you look at the sectors that are due to receive the most of that funding, both infrastructure and indeed private equity are gonna be big benefactors of the money that's pouring into the private markets as we speak. A little bit closer to home, the growth here is equally as exciting, if not more so. Um, the growth that we forecast that will happen here in the Asia Pacific over the coming years is actually again very much concentrated around all things relating to infrastructure and so there's going to be some really interesting areas to explore um, and some really interesting growth on that Kaga side that we'll see over the months and the years in front of us and again if you're working in a product or an organization that opportunity set is significant 
because by 2026, over one fifth of all assets under management will be alternatives, but they'll be delivering over half of the revenues that an organization is actually getting to service and to look after those particular funds as well. So a lot of um, companies in the GP space are looking and rushing to build products to capture that appetite and that growth. So a few thoughts I thought I'd put here before I talk about the Kaya programs, I think is interesting as a backdrop to perhaps areas you're thinking about for your own professional development. But I think we really are in an investor disruption stage of the evolution of both private markets and public markets. There's disruption across the entire value chain. You're seeing a lot of consolidation, you're seeing a lot of collaboration, you're seeing a lot of democratization and you're seeing tokenization access to more products, access to a wider range of investors um, are providing kind of widespread growth and widespread changes. I think for most groups, you've got to build your own or promote products by other people or partner, or you're going to wither on the vine and unfortunately fade away. Equally, we're seeing that diversification underlined um, growing across all ends of the investment scale. And again, tokenization and um, democratization are really helping with that more mass affluent and retail uh, money sources finding access to private markets as well. I think the big thing we've got to think about is ESG. There's been a lot of headlines about that, about greenwashing and how that looks the last couple of weeks. But I think the outcomes matter increasingly to both millennials and Generation Alpha. And they're going to see some great things happen around that more philanthropic pursuits um, from that particular sector of the investor community side by side with institutional investors as well. So all roads are absolutely pointing to significant growth, significant opportunity, massive disruption. Um, and with that, I feel anyone that wants to work in or looking to be more familiar with how alternative investments work, um, it's a good place to be because there's going to be some significant opportunities continuing to be found across the entire sector, and notably from here in the Asia Pacific. So with that as the backdrop, um, I know you're here this evening to learn more about the great services that Kaplan provide to help you with training to pass and to study for the Kaya designation. As far as the Kaya organization is concerned, we really have a mission to create values and principles around the curriculum that we have built, um, underlining leadership and advocacy within the actual sector. And we really wish to have the Kaya Charter as, as that independent qualification to help with professionals that are working within the alternative investment sector. Um, and as far as our organization is concerned, we have over 13,000 members now around the world from over 100 different countries. Um, they come across some 33 different chapters, so little kind of cohort style members in various parts of the world that get together. We have eight of those here in Asia. Our biggest group is here in Hong Kong. And in fact, this is our 20th year this year. So there's been a lot of change occur within Kaya in the last few years. As a member-based organization, we work with a whole raft of academics and different associations. We have an awful lot of research and events and publications that we publish and host. I look forward to sharing more with you about that over the course of this session, and I indeed hope beyond as well. We write a lot. There's a phenomenal resource um, or repository of resources available on our website around our thought leadership. We just launched a portfolio for the future a couple of months back looking at why we think the 60-40 portfolio is dead and how effective capital allocation needs to be looked at in a very different way moving forward. And just earlier this month, back on October the 5th, we launched a publication called A Renewed Professionalism. And if you're keen to learn more about that particular publication, with Christie's blessing, we've included a QR code here for you to take a link through to get a feel for the things that we're thinking about here at Kaya and how we need to be thinking about developments for that portfolio and for that growth as well. Now we think about the, um, the, the features that Kaya provides, it's very much distinguishing yourself and separating yourself from those that perhaps ha have other professional qualifications. But we really think that the relevancy of our curriculum and the current um, update of our curriculum provides some great 
insight to you and to help you with that growth and knowledge. Now, the Kaya examination itself is a two-level exam. Um, we revise the content regularly. One of the challenges, truthfully, about working in alternative investments is they're growing, they're changing. We're not absolutely cutting edge, but we're bleeding edge by way of what we actually cover and the different features of what we look within the portfolio. Uh, but we really feel that the future focus of a curriculum ensures that you're already and familiar with the different things that are actually happening within the alternative investment sector. Of those two levels to the examination, a level one really looks at professional standards and ethics and acts as an introduction to alternative investments. We look at real assets, we look at private securities, we look at hedge funds and also structured products. The whole of level one in the exam stage is both um, papers are all multiple choice, um, making it a little bit easier to study and revise and prepare for. And then once one has completed and passed level one, you may pass and move through to level two. Now here we really pop in more emerging topics, looking at models. We look at some of the actual institutional asset owner themes and approaches. We look at due diligence and how you select um, investments for your alternative investments portfolio. We look at access, we look at volatility. And for the level two curriculum, it's more about the application of competence and understanding. So half of the exam is multiple choice, and the other half is constructive responses, testing your ability to adopt and apply that that's been learned by both level one and also level two. So for us within Kaya, there has been some changes that I mentioned, there's some great new things that we've actually added in 2023's curriculum. We've refreshed a good deal of the content. A lot of the data has been refreshed as well. We've got four new emerging topics that we've actually added for those that are going to be taking a level two paper. And we've got a much broader array of both authors and also industry contributors to round out a more global feel of what it is that we're actually putting within the curriculum itself. For the first time, our March of 2023 exams will be bundled and what we mean there is we've actually bundled the curriculum into um, a different access to provide a digital experience to get access to the curriculum um, as and when you register for the exam as well. So we're hoping that'll make the studying a little bit easier. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And that digital learning platform will really give you a more efficient way of learning, um, a, a, an easier way of accessing the data, accessing the information and some great features to Keep your study notes in, the, in a bit of a centralised place and be more familiar with how you're going about the um, your study calendar. And so that digital learning platform will provide a great opportunity to have everything online before you're waiting for the maybe the original books to be sent to you via the post. Um, you can go to our website, kai.org forward slash candidates. There's a massive pool of data and information and downloads that are available for you there. Um, where our study resources are all centralised. And um, if you've not had a chance to look at that part of the website yet, we really encourage you to take a look at that. And for anybody here this evening on the phone or perhaps there on campus, if you are a CFA member and you haven't taken a CHIRA examination historically, you're eligible to apply for our stackable credential program which means you can migrate straight through to level two of the Kaya program and actually skip having to take level one. I'm very happy to answer any questions about that if there's anybody there in the room or on the phone that wants to learn more about it. But for CFA members in good standing that haven't taken the exam before, they may enter the program as a level two candidate. From a costs perspective, we've, we've actually reduced our costs um, for our level one exam um, fees for this next round of, um, of exam candidates. There is an enrollment fee of $400 and then the actual exam registration, which includes the digital curriculum, is $995. And that's within that early registration window. Um, and then if you miss that early registration window, the costs for the exam go up to $1,300 and $95. From a date perspective, registration opened back on the 3rd of October, but the good news is that open for early registration goes right through to the end of next month. So you've got plenty of time to take advantage of that 995 rate if you are thinking about taking your level one exam 
come March of 2023. Once you've gone through both level one and level two and wish to become a member, there are annual fees that one pays um, and there are a fee of $350 for those that are based here in Hong Kong. Um, or there's a more affiliate and or a retired fee there as well. Um, you might want to be thinking about as you look at your studies moving forward. And to give you a feel for the sort of pl players that we have who are members, obviously the banks, the consultants, the fund managers, the asset owners and asset allocators are um, all well versed with our members. We have an awful lot of regulators, staff that work, work within the regulations that are building the blueprint to put all things around alternative investments together are also our members and worthwhile having a look at. And obviously, once you have that membership, we think it's about that visibility. We provide continued learning and great access to participation to events and things that we're hosting, both physically and also virtually for those that aren't able to get to physical events. And then just finally, what we have here is once one has become a member, we actually extend to you a digital badge, which you can put onto your personal profile on LinkedIn that spotlights you and showcases you and different, differentiates you. Um, and that's something which we have put into place in the last couple of years, actually. We had some support from our members and requests for that digital engagement or that digital um, charter holder status that you can put up on your profile. Now, there's a QR code there to link through to our LinkedIn page, but I'm very keen to pass the microphone back to Larry. Um, as Christy shared at the beginning of the conversation today, CapPlan are our longest standing partner um, from a preparatory course perspective here and actually indeed around the world. And Larry and his team there at CapPlan have been providing live courses for both level one and level two candidates for many years. It's always a pleasure to get together and work. We know that most of our members around the world have actually had some help on their studies and find the rhythm and the rigor that a classroom engagement provides very, very assistive. And therefore, I'm really happy to be here this evening to share this insight on Kaya and some background on the, on the industry before you get to hear from Larry and his walkthrough of how Kaplan could help you with taking your level one Kaya exam. So thank you for your attention. We'll wait for the end for questions, but I'll hand over here to Larry, if I may. And uh, thank you for taking the time to hear my presentation this evening. Thanks, Christy. I'll hand it back, if I may. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. That's excellent presentation. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll turn the camera off for now, and I'll unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is, it is uh, very um, uh, encouraging to look at these presentations. Um, seeing the growth, the strong growth of the industries in the past and also expected to continue in the coming years. And um, in particular, it's the Asia Pacific, okay? So there could be strong growth of the industry and also strong growth of the alternative investments. And uh, as Joe pointed out that there will be more and more disruption in the industries and we have more uh, different types of investments coming up yeah, to be um, added into the portfolio for our clients. So it is a very good opportunity for all of us yeah, to participate on, on the growth. Yeah. But the question is, uh, how can we um, uh, get our share out of the growth? Yeah, how can we uh, join the industries or participate of the growth of the industries? So, um, okay, there we are. So we are going to look at the Kaya examinations, the curriculum, right? Yeah, um, to to sign in for the examinations and how to become a charter of the Kaya, so that you got a a, a worldwide, uh, globally recognized uh, qualification. And I think that would be a very um, useful um, a door opener, yeah, for for us, for those that who want who want to join the join the industries and learn a bit more of this. Um, the new trend of the alternative investments. Okay, all right. So uh, here we are. I am Larry, Larry Yun. Yeah, I'm a full-time lecturer at Kaplan. Uh, before I joined Kaplan, I spent quite a long time yeah, in the industries, right? Um, I would say in my, in my first half of my career, I, I spent most of, most of my time with the traditional investments. It's like a portfolio managers on, the, on a multi-asset portfolio. But 
As you know that in the old days, when we say multi-asset portfolio is mostly is either equities and fixed income, okay? And then in my second half of the career, I move on to private banking and um, as a portfolio counselor and also a specialist on these uh, managed products, uh, including all these different kind of funds, hedge funds and um, private equities. So it gave me a lot of uh, opportunities, right, to learn from the industries. Yeah, so hopefully I can make use of all these uh, uh, experience exposures to help you yeah, to prepare for the examination. And uh, okay, the agenda, we're going to look at the industries and then we look at the, um, the lecture materials and to go through the, the approach that uh, here we have in Kaplan, uh, how to expedite your preparation for the examinations, right? Uh, which we think is very important because the examination actually includes a lot of topics. Um, uh, here, I just want to um, uh, highlight a point here. Yeah, for those people who who, who um, sign up for the CHI examinations, comes from a very diverse background, right? Um, just look at our classes. Yeah, our students. Yeah, they come from different um, different sectors, like uh, the the asset owners, the consultants, um, the salespeople, yeah, or even from the back office. Yeah, I, I have students from um, the compliance department. Yeah, and they are um, at different levels. You are some of those are just like uh, newcomers, uh, new joiners of the company, and some others. Well, uh, they are at the management level already. Okay, so it's very diverse background. Yeah, okay, that is uh, what we are facing here. Yeah, and some of those are quite familiar with uh, some particular topics, areas of the curriculum. Like uh, if they work in a real estate fund as an analyst, right? They are quite familiar with all these different topics relating to the real assets, right? But for those sales people or might be compliance people, they they need a bit more uh, hand holdings. Yeah, to go through all these uh, foundations and the background. So that is why we are here, right? We try to cater to um, candidates, students of different levels, right? So that no matter what your background is, we, we try to uh, be flexible. Yeah, see how we can help. Um, well, these are the backgrounds. I think we can skip it as Joe has made a very excellent presentation on the industries already. Okay, let's go straight to the curriculum. Uh, level one and level two here, okay? So uh, level one and level two, um, as uh, Kaya put it in this way, that level one gives us a very uh, broad um, uh, knowledge and background on the uh, so-called building blocks. Yeah, uh, building blocks like uh, different types of alternative investments on real assets, uh, private capitals, hedge funds, and structured products, right? And then you have the level two. Um, you move on, it's like a, it's a top-down approach. How to put all these different types of investments together in a portfolio? Uh, or how do we add the alternative investments into a traditional portfolios to achieve certain goals or objectives? Uh, well, if I may, I just go back to level one. Uh, let me just focus on level one. Um, here you can see this, the building blocks, real assets, private equities, hedge fund, and structured products, right? Um, we, we, we need to have a good understanding of all these different types of alternative investments at level one, yeah, for the examinations. But then again, I would say that most of my students, they, they say this, introductions to alternative investment actually uh, uh, it's more difficult than the other sections. <laughs> yeah, maybe once that you got some ideas of the um, alternative investments and, and also some ideas about this investment science, then you can move on. Yeah, it is easier for you to pick up all these different um, models, topics on the um, um, alternative investments. But before, before we move on to building blocks, right, we need to build a good foundation. But when we say introduction to alternative investment, actually there are quite a lot of um, uh, traditional investment topics there, right? It's like uh, how do we measure the return? How do we measure the risk? How do we look at these different type of variation models? And then we also talk about some kind of a derivatives. How 
derivatives work. Okay, as you know that, yeah, alternative investment got some uh, popular features like they like to use leverage. They like to use derivatives. Okay, so we need to understand how this leverage and deri derivatives work in the investments in the portfolio. And also in the in this topic introductions, yeah, we also have to touch on some quantitative uh, topics uh, like um, regressions, right? Yeah, something that can help us to test the models and see whether the investment strategies work and whether it only worked in the past. Does it work in the futures? How do we make the evaluation of the fund managers? And all this will be crammed into this topic. The introductions to alternative investments. So be prepared. Yeah, we, we are going to spend some time on this topic before we move on. Yeah. Once that you got a good foundation on this, yes. Yeah, you're ready to learn this real assets, private equities, hedge funds and structured products. So real assets, right? Um, as Joe mentioned that one particular area of the real assets has very significant growth recently in the past few years, which is infrastructure. Okay, we also touch on infrastructures here. And apart from infrastructure, we'll talk on different type of um, uh, real assets like uh, real estate, uh, farmland, timberland. Well, if you um, uh, have been reading on this uh, ESG topics, you know that farmland has also been a very popular recently. Yeah, because it is also one of the choice for ESG investments. Okay, then private equities. Okay, maybe nowadays we talk more on the private capital, right? Or private assets, yeah, not just equities, right? And uh, you, you see there are more and more private debts in the markets. So uh, we will talk, well, it's uh, broadly everything about this uh, private assets, not just private equities. And hedge funds, right? Uh, hedge funds will touch on different strategies. We will have to understand the profile of different hedge fund strategies. Not all the hedge fund strategies are aggressive. Not all the hedge funds are volatile, right? We have different kind of hedge funds. We have to understand different strategies. Yeah, with that understanding, we can know yeah, how to make use of different, different hedge funds to achieve different objectives. And lastly, it's about the structured products. Uh, structured products, well, well, it might be a bit uh, mathematical, quantitative to some people. But then again, at level one, our focus is to the concept. How can we make use of different derivatives to achieve certain specific objectives? Okay, so these are the topics that we have in level one. Yeah, uh, there's quite a lot. Yeah, if you are going to go through all this in month, one or two months' time, yeah, you really have to um, have the discipline. Yeah, you have to make time for it, right? Okay, so. Of course, it is a worldwide recognized qualification. So I, I won't say it is easy, but once that you have set your schedule, set your discipline, and um, um, yeah, we can help you to get through this. Uh, level two, yeah, as Joe mentioned again, there are a lot of new things in the industries and uh, the technologies, disruptions, uh, new asset classes. Then here at level two, you will have a chances to touch on these different new topics. Um, and thank goodness you don't have to cram everything at one level, right? At least you got the level one, you passed the level one, then you got another six months to prepare for level two, all right? Uh, okay, Joe has gone through all these uh, um, administrative issues here, the fees, the passing rate, uh, and here. Now, coming back to Kaplan, yeah, how can we help? Um, to well, to help you to exp expedite your study. Um, well, different people have different um, um, preferences yeah, of learning. Right? Um, yeah, some people can go through this all by themselves, right? Yeah, and some people would like to have a lot of hand holdings. Uh, I think there's a lot of different variations among the students, right? But all we can do here is, okay, we have a very, um, it's quite demanding curriculum yeah, to go through uh, with the time constraint, yeah. And here I can help my students to go through all these different topics, curriculums within the time constraint. Okay, yeah. And that is what we mean by to expedite your study. Um, of course, to do this, yeah, um, we have to be flexible. Right? 
And of course, our core offering here is, okay, come to Kaplan campus. Yeah, we have this classroom tuition, right? Face to face, I talk to my students, go through all these different topics, and also go through the questions, right? And on top of this, of course, we have this on-demand class and other type of course materials, yeah, which can help you to go through the materials more efficiently. Yeah, I have to emphasize again, efficiency. Expertise your study. That is the key to success for the examinations. Okay, for the rest, yeah, I, I got a few slides here. Just uh, want to highlight to you um, some of this um, quantitative concepts that we uh, have to go through for the exam, right? Because very often I got questions from my students and asking me whether it is very uh, quantitative, yeah, whether the curriculum uh, requires the students to study a lot of uh, quantitative concepts and do a lot of calculations in the examinations. Very popular questions, right? Okay, so I, I, I got some slides here to, to, to go through with you and uh, let you be the judge. Yeah, to see how quantitative it is. For example, here, yeah, it, it is uh, extracted from this, um, uh, as I already mentioned before, is the introductions to alternative investment section. Okay, yeah. So within this section, there are a lot of different topics, right? And uh, one of those topics is related to the risk measurements, to understand, yeah, what are the risks that we are undertaking, right, in our investments. And there are a lot of different risk measures, a lot of different risk measures, our uh, uh, potential losses in our investments. To, to, to measure these investments losses, yeah, we call it the risk, and one of the very popular measures is called value at risk, yeah, the VAR. And here you can see that uh, these are the requirements. We are required to describe different methods of this measurement, okay? So value at risk is one way to measure the risk, okay? And we are required to understand this concept, to describe the different methods, yeah? And then we are asked to, might be to work it out, estimate, estimate, estimate. So that is the calculation part. And what do we mean by value at risk? So, so for, for those of us that we, we have not uh, studied the statistics before, and uh, maybe we have left school a long time ago, yeah, might, maybe we have no ideas yeah, of what it is. But just in layman terms, uh, in layman terms, right? Yeah, if we expect that we can have a return, that is the mean, that is the estimate of our expected returns for our investments, it is a point estimate, yeah, at one point here. It could be 1% a day, 1% a week, okay, so, but it's bound to be wrong. Our estimates usually, yeah, cannot be 100% accurate. Yeah, it could be higher, it could be lower, right, yeah. Our estimates cannot be 100% accurate. Yeah, if you ask me what is the Hang Seng Index next year at this time, yeah, I can give you a number, but I'm bound to be wrong. Yeah, I better give you a range. Yeah, instead of saying 20,000, I give you a range 15 to 25,000. Yeah, so we come down to the probability concept now. Yeah, if I give you a point here, expect a return, I, I nearly have zero chance of being correct. If I give you a range, I have some chances to be correct. And these chances, we say it is the Confidence, yeah. So it depends on how much confidence that you want when you say this range. So in this example, okay, if I want to have 95% confidence, okay, so this range here, okay, that means I have 5% chance being wrong on the other side, all right? So this is the VAR. I have 5% have an investment results worse than this, okay? So that is more meaningful when I talk to my clients instead of giving my client an estimate, okay? So that is the VAR. So we have to specify the probability yeah, of the potential loss 
within a certain period. Okay, so conceptually, that is what this var is, value at risk. And for the calculation part, how to estimate it? Yeah. The variation of the actual result is measured by something called standard deviations. Okay. Well, of course, it is one way to measure it. There are other methods. But let's just focus on this. With this standard deviations, okay, depends on our specified period and also our level of confidence required. So, yeah, this is our confidence. Yeah, this is the specified terms or specify the period, okay? Okay, that is the volatilities of our investments. Uh, putting them all together, yeah, you can either work out it in a percentage terms or in dollar term if you times the value of your investments in the calculation as well, okay? For example here, very simple, if you got uh, investments, $10 million, okay? And the investment value goes up and down, and that is measured by this standard deviation, 0.58%. And we have to pay attention, particularly in the exam, right? Uh, what data are we given in the question? Here, this is the daily, daily standard deviation. If we are asked to work out a 10-day VAR, you see this is a mismatch. So we have to convert this daily standard deviations into a 10-day standard deviation. So 0.58 is converted to 10 day by multiplying the square root of 10. Okay. So just like uh, the equation we just gone through, we put all these different inputs together and then at the end we work out this. So with a portfolio of 10 million dollars, in a 10 days period, yeah, there's a 5% chance you might lose yeah, this 302630 or even more. So that is one of the risk measures, okay? Uh, is it very quantitative? Well, it depends on your background, yeah. Well, some people might say it is very straightforward, right? Yeah, and uh, other related issues on the VAR as well. And let me just uh, show you one more thing. Uh, this is about options. And this is also another topics in the introductions to alternative investments, right? Yeah, and uh, options, it is a kind of derivatives, right? We have to, well, this is a requirements in the curriculum for the students. We have to understand, recognize the characteristics yeah, of all these different type of options, right? Uh, not so much on the calculations, not so much on the calculations, right? So, but we have to understand what these options can do for us or might be what they can do for our clients. So we have to go through all these uh, building blocks of the options. Like uh, if we long a call, that means we buy a call. When we buy a call, we have a right to buy. Okay. So when the underlying asset, for example, if I buy an option on the Hang Seng Index, when the Hang Seng Index goes up in this way on the X axis, yeah, with a call, I make profit. Okay. So that is a positive relationship. And if I short a call, that means I, I sell you a call option, right? I sell your call option, you see, that is just a mirror image of the long call options, right? Long call, when the Hang Seng Index goes up, you make a profit. Short call, when the Hang Seng Index goes up, you make a loss, okay? So depending on your view, yeah, are you bullish? You buy a call. Are you bearish? Yeah, you sell a call, yeah. And other options like put, give you a right to sell. Yeah, you can see this uh, payoff diagram is different now, right? Payoff, uh, when the Hang Seng Index goes down, you make a profit. That means it gives you the protection on the market collapse. So in October, if you hold Hang Seng Index put option, congratulations. <laughs> okay, so you see these the different diagrams and then we can put these different diagrams together to make option strategies, okay? Going up, going down, uh, you want to be bullish, bearish, range trading, all this can be done 
with a combination of the options. Okay, so as long as we remember that core is bullish, yeah. If you're bullish, you buy core. If you if you want protection, you buy put. And then depending on your time horizon, you can strategize different option strategies. Okay, so uh, in the class, we'll go through these different option strategies: bull spread, bear spread. Yeah, they serve different purposes, and it really depends on your view or your client's view. Yeah, which strategies are appropriate. Okay, lastly, yeah, in the class, we might go through some questions like this. Yeah, for example, if we want to use this uh, uh, derivatives to hatch, that is our purpose. And who we are, yeah, we produce commodities. Oh, no, we, <laughs> we don't produce commodities. We hold this uh, commodity producers debt in our investment portfolio. So we have commodities risk, right, uh, in the format of debt. Yeah, if the commodities producers have any financial trouble, the debt value will go down. Yeah, how can we protect us from the value of the debt going down? Well, we can hedge our exposure. Which one? Options or futures? Okay. So in the class, we'll go through this. Yeah, and to explain, yeah, how we can make use of the options, how we can recognize which option strategies is appropriate for which purposes or objectives. Okay, that's what we do in the class. Um, all right? Okay, so I should stop here. Yeah, and uh, I pass it back to Christy. Yeah, Christy got more information for you.